Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our penultimate uh, virtual career chat of 2022. I can't believe we're nearly at the end of another year, but let's not dwell on that. This morning, we are going to um, be discussing the role of a logistics manager. Delighted to have with us today one of our very own veterans, Usman Morong. Usman, if you can put your camera on, that'd be amazing. And we um, from EKFB, and we also have Julie from Keir, who is there, but camera not working, but very much in the room. So sit back, enjoy. I'm going to hand over to Angela. Hey, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual career chats. I'm Angela Forbes, and it is a pleasure to welcome you this morning on the 1st of December. So there was little festive cheer in our house this morning. We ran out of milk and chaos ensued. So the dry coffee cup sitting lonely on the kitchen side. So perhaps after this, we'll get some Bill Crosby or Shaking Stevens on to improve the mood. Now, since our last virtual chat, we have hosted the successful Intercore Boxing Evening with the RLC and Remy. So the level of boxing was outstanding and it was a great night had by all. So look out for the event in next year's schedule. Now, our own team have been back at their desks this week, all wrapped up in their winter woolies and refusing to put the heating on. Now, whilst it is tolerable for some, it's harder for others and will continue to be as the temperatures are set to drop further. If you are struggling or feeling a little overwhelmed by this time of year, then please reach out to our team. We are here to help you, every single one of you. Now, as you are transitioning, we have this timetable of virtual chats to help you navigate around the careers in construction. Now, this morning, our chat is centred around logistics. To explain what logistics looks like in the construction industry, we, we, we will hear from veterans Julie Taylor from Kier and Usman Morong from the HS2 joint venture, AKFB, which are Ifaj Kier, Ferrovio and BAM. So without further ado, we'll hand over to our first speaker, Julie, to get us going. And Julie, we'll switch our cameras off. Morning. Um, two apologies. What the first one is, I'm a little bit croaky. Um, so a couple of days ago, I lost my voice, but it seems to have come back. But I don't normally sound as croaky as this. So that's one apology. And second apology is, um, with all my IT experience, it appears that my camera doesn't actually work when I log into Teams, despite having worked previously in a meeting this morning. So. I've been foiled by the camera, so apologies that I've not got my face on show, but hopefully during the course of this, I'll manage to um, fix my camera and at least at least show that I'm a real person. So, um, yes, so, and I'll start with, I'll just um, kind of give a run through of, of my career in the logistics world post-Army, um, and then a couple of sort of lessons learned or couple of learning points for me that I can share with you that, that I think might help you along the way. Um, yeah, whether or not that, that that is helpful or not, I don't know, but, that, but it, that's just my experience. So, um, so yeah, I was in the RLC for nine years. I left as a senior captain, so as the adjutant of 27 Reg was my last uh, posting, um, left in 2014. And I knew I wanted to stay in logistics, but I didn't really know what what field I wanted to end up in in the civilian world. So I've I've spent since then really working in various different fields. So I had a chunk of time in the automotive industry and then moved across into the rail industry, then into construction. And now I'm very much in that construction world. So I currently work for Kia in a utilities world which is, is part of their construction um, arm still managing logistics so and each one of those roles has been very different to the other roles um so i spent when i left i started at jaguar land rover mainly because jlr had a very good ex-forces recruitment policy at the time so i found it quite quite easy it's probably not the, the right word but almost a natural fit that they were recruiting a lot of ex-military and it, it was just natural that they were keen they looked like they could um there was a lot of career progression within that industry so went through the an interview process and ended up in in jaguar land rover and spent two years there working in a strategy role so i was doing a lot of planning and strategy for future 
logistics of how they move cars from factory to customer essentially um really interesting really good role and a very good company to work for very supportive and and a, and a good way to transition from military life to civilian life um and and the the way that logistics works in automotive is it's it's very shiny it's very polished everything is planned to minute detail and and i found that what i was doing was sort of tweaking things sort of tweaking a plan looking at volumes looking at forecasts and and contracts and and looking at the sort of the the wider piece which which was good for my understanding but not really what i wanted to do on a on a sort of permanent role so i think it gave me a really good understanding of life in logistics after army um, and also gave me a good understanding of the sort of contractual and commercial world and then and then showed me that really i wanted to work in the projects world so that's why i started to look at rail and construction because that's all very much project based so there's a start there's a middle and an end um so that i went from that role to working on a, a rail project in based in derby which was the electrification of middle and main line so huge project running right down the, the the east of the country to electrify one of the um rail lines and again i went into that role through through networking really went to um a couple of rail co companies were host, hosting an X Forces event, so went along to that, asked some questions, shared my CV, met met the right people, um, and a, an ex um, lieutenant colonel was putting together a a team to support the the build of that rail job. So I was lucky enough to be given the job of logistics manager for for arranging that. So I spent three years on that job, and I think that's probably where I learned most of most of the sort of tools that I'm using now in in this job so I went from sort of putting together or or honing the strategy for how logistics would work doing the operational bit of where we would have warehouses and plant and people and how we'd move things around and do we use subcontractors or do we use our own internal fleet and do we how many people do we need and what that structure looks like and then and then delivered that project and then did the close out at the end of it's all coming to an end and what do we do with all this stuff and, um so that that for me that that was a really good opportunity so three years of work of of i felt like i was living and breathing logistics in the in the rail or construction world um and i and i enjoyed that and realized that's that's really where my skills were best sat really so from from that job, I then moved across again from from military contacts. Really, I moved across into into HS2 world actually onto EKFB, which is which is where Usman is now. So I spent eighteen months working for EKFB again as a logistics manager, doing very similar things, working out the the flow of people and the flow of material into and out of sites and that daily operation and daily flow of of things around the hs2 trace um and, and i think it it was really only then after doing that sort of few years of of um operational logistics that i felt that i was i'd, I'd got to a point where i had enough experience to sort of very much hold my own in that in that logistics world so i could i could come across anything in construction logistics and know how to put a plan together, know what was needed, know what would work and what wouldn't work. So, I, I, yeah, it felt like I had that experience, but it took me several years to kind of get all those ticks in boxes and and, and know what I could offer, really. Um, and then from, from that role, I've also spent, I spent six months doing a slightly different role, still based on HS2 logistics, but looking at tendering for a new uh, a new piece of work so a joint venture that is tendering for the next phase of hs2 which is building the railway on top of the civils i was asked to um, put together the logistics strategy for that so how that would work 
and put the pricing together behind it. So that was very much using the experience that I gained in all those other different jobs to bring it all together and say, right, well, there's this huge piece of work that's going to take five years to build the railway. I think your logistics needs to look like this and then working out the price behind that. Um, and that was really interesting. And again, I felt I could use all that experience I've gained to actually propose something that I knew would work and, and sort of develop, tweak it in accordance with the cost and, and, and the output and, and what the scope is. Um, so that, yeah, that, that was an interesting piece of work and that was sort of outside that operational environment. And then that was a that was a six month job. And then from there, I moved across into my current job, which is working for key utilities, which is essentially delivering um, fibre to people's homes in cities in the in the southwest. So still really a construction job and I'm still managing logistics. But the role I'm in now, I was brought in as more of a an improvement role so there's an just there's a, an existing logistics setup um but it wasn't working very well it was inefficient it was losing money it wasn't compliant to all the health and safety standards we've got depots that aren't run very well so i've done a sort of six month improvement plan for how that how those logistics should work and and i've now implemented that so again that's i'm still doing logistics on a daily basis but but I also have got that development and the improvement and the the sort of putting in best best practice to something that that wasn't working very well in the first place. So again, that's using the experience that I've learned along the way, as well as what I've what I've had from military experience to bring that in and to implement that. So it's it, again that it, it, it feels like I've I've had chunks of time on different projects that are all very different. Um, still working in in the logistics field, but I feel I've had a, an input into or an insight into a lot of different areas, which which gives you a lot of different skills. So, um, yeah, I think I think from my side, um, I feel like I've had sort of a varied logistics um, career post post military. And I think a couple a couple of my lessons learned really would be one is which which I didn't really comprehend when I when I left. There's so many different logistics functions in different industries that all work differently. So there's no kind of blueprint for when you move into civilian life. This is what logistics looks like. So automotive for me is totally different to the way logistics works in construction. Construction is very much sort of logistics is is in its infancy. There's a very little understanding of what logistics is and what it can offer to the to the industry. So you're almost doing a bit of a hearts and minds piece to buy people into, you know, a, a logistics function can work and deliver efficiencies. So that that's very different from that sort of shiny automotive world where that's that's been up and running for a long time. Um, and then and then you've got the the tendering piece, which is a proposal for sort of future logistics and then looking at what can be brought in in terms of new technology and sort of sustainable solutions and using electric vehicles and using electric plant. Um, again, that's that's a slightly different world. So I think my one of my key messages is, is don't don't think that logistics is the same across all these different industries. It it, it varies quite massively um, and I think one of my one of my other lessons learned would be when I was going through that transition phase my mindset was very much what do I want to do permanently what's my what's my permanent future role where do I want to be I want to work in logistics what does that look like whereas once I'd done that two years in automotive I had a better understanding then of of what I wanted to do so it, I would, I would advise don't don't think that your first job is necessarily the one you're going to be in for the long term. Almost use it as a stepping stone into civilian life, civilian logistics. Take lots from it, learn lots from it, and use it as a bit of an understanding of this is how it all works, and this is where I fit into the big piece. So, 
yeah, try and focus not on not so much on what do I want to do in 10 years time, try and focus on what what suits me for now and what gives me all those ticks in boxes. That's if you don't know where, where to go, you might you might be fully up to speed and you might you might have a plan and, and you, you know, how are you going to get there? But, um, I think the end, yeah, they're my two main points. And, and I guess my third point would would be don't. Don't be scared to learn when I if I came out of the, the army now and went straight into the job I'm doing now, I just wouldn't have that understanding piece to be able to do it very well. I'd still have all those military skills that, that that we all know and love, but I wouldn't have I wouldn't have the industry knowledge to be able to do it. So just give yourself a bit of time to know that you need to absorb all this different information, the way that different industries work, the way that contracts work, the way that commercial works and programs and forecasts and all that sort of all that stuff that maybe you've not been exposed to. And just let that sink in and, and it, it'll just take a bit of time to be able to come out the other end with all those skills to add to your military skills, if that makes sense. Don't 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 expect that you'll be able to jump into a certain role in logistics in industry and be up and running straight away and know how it all works because you won't. You, yes, you'll be good at logistics and you'll be able to organise what goes where. But you won't have that understanding of of that individual industry. So just just accept that you'll have a chunk of time that is just learning, learning about how it all works. And and I found that people are very good at giving you the time to do that as well, the time to develop and the time to kind of run with your, learn your plan, learn your trade. So that yeah, that's a kind of that's a kind of very brief run through um, a lot of different jobs in the uh, in the logistics world. Julie, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. If I could ask Usman to turn his camera on and join us. Good. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Usman. As it says here, Usman Morong. Uh, I'm an abnormal load and fleet manager for EKFB, as Julie said. So but I'm on the other side. Uh, uh, to give you a brief idea, uh, EKFB is 80 kilometers wide from uh, North Chilterns, where I am now, which is Wendover, all the way to Warwickshire. So it's like 80 kilometers long. So I am at the very beginning of it as um, NCA area. So and within NCA, we got about quite few areas, uh, sites that would compounds, we call them compounds, so like uh, Rocky Lane, uh, Small Dean Viaduct, uh, Nasley, and, you know, Wendover. So it's, we got quite a few of them. So as I go through you will, through the slides, you will come across it. So the company EKFB, as Julie said, uh, we all work for the same company. Uh, it consists of four uh, uh, joint, uh, stakeholders. If I, if I, which is French, Care, I think that's why uh, um, uh, Julie works for Ferrovial. I work for Ferrovial and Bam Nuttall. So um, what happened is when you join EKFB. You will come under one of them. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, if you are employed by EAF, EKFP. Uh, you will come under one of them, either Ifarch, uh, Kia, Ferrovial, or BAM. So when I joined, I came under Ferrovial. Uh, in my team, some are Kia, some are BAM, some are Ifarch. So you know, once you join the uh, the joint venture, you will be uh, allocated uh, a parent company. So my parent company is Ferrovial, which is a, a Spanish company. So it's a joint venture that brings together like uh, different um, expertise uh, in this uh, market of construction. So, uh, I mean, it's a quite a big companies. Uh, these companies are very massive as well, and uh, they have um, lots of stakes. Um, uh, some of them have been on uh, Crossrail, which I happen to be at for three years in London. So yeah, so now and in HS2 as well. So you got quite a few of uh, joint ventures all the way uh, up north and where it stops. So um, next slide, uh, my background, uh, Royal Navy, obviously, uh, I spent five years on, uh, in Royal uh, Royal Navy. Um, um, well, all that time I was at sea, so uh, on uh, Southern HMS Lancaster, all my time in the Navy. So sometimes when I come off, I don't have the leg 
So my legs will be flapping about because I spend so much time at sea. Anytime I'm on so I have to, you know, learn how to walk again. So that's how bad it was for me, but it was, uh, was really enjoyable. I did enjoy my time. And if I have to do it again, I will do it again. So that's how good it is. Uh, yeah. Um, resettlement, when I was coming out, it wasn't that, um, uh, was only CTP. So what I was doing is like spend some time in CTP office or uh, in the library. So there's no, not that much uh, like, uh, build force maybe it was but I wasn't aware of so basically what I was doing is library working on my CV and things like that and mine was not in uh, post mode I was based at fast lane that time so I was doing all mine at, uh, up there so but once I left the Navy I started looking for job then first I went into concierge because I wanted to study um, <clears throat> So I was working nights as a consistent day uh, going to school. So uh, once I graduated, I was working in a small family company uh, as a logistics and um, office manager. And uh, these cross rail people were looking for ex-military uh, at the time. So I had a call from them. They said, oh, we are looking for people from the military background to come and work uh, in cross rail. Uh, I said, yeah, OK, that's fine. Uh, they took my CV away. Um, Remember when I was at uh, Wine Intelligence, which was a family company, I was a logistics and a, a, a office manager. But when I joined Crossrail, they put me on the, as a uh, operative, so as a logistics. So I was uh, doing that. And within three months, uh, the logistics manager uh, left the job. Then they sent me on courses and automatically put me up as a logistics uh, manager uh, for no brems. I don't know. Uh, if any of you lives in London, if you see Jubilee Line, Jubilee Line got sliding doors. So these sliding doors uh, were built by West West uh, West Sinton House, but which was later bought by uh, No Brems. No, so No Brems built this uh, on um, uh, Queen Elizabeth Lines as well. So some of the stations will have this. So they are there to protect people from uh, like dropping over or. Um, uh, mice or rats getting onto the platform and you know going uh, into the cities and uh, infecting the areas so it, it is a good plan behind it so uh, as, uh i worked in crossrail so from there my career built up so they sent me on courses i did my smsts triple sts and uh, other courses health and safety so once that project ended then um uh, I started looking for job. Then I, that was just in time for COVID, so people went into lockdown. Then I, I moved into uh, a Vistry partnership, which was in Bristol. I live in London, so I went to Bristol for a while. Then came back. Then um, the, the job finished. Then I joined Thomas Bo as well. So once that uh, project ended. Um, I joined UK Health Security Agency, working as a, a planner uh, for uh, the COVID uh, role. So I, I was there. Um, the job was actually meant for uh, one year, but you know, as the Prime Minister made the announcement, that's the end of COVID. They pulled the plug on the job, so the uh, the job went quiet. Then I've been looking for job since then. So, but what I was doing, my thing is. Um, I always have bill force in tow because they came useful. And what a thing that really um, helps me is like anytime I see a job, especially on LinkedIn, what I will do is I will go onto um, the company advertising the job or uh, the person advertising the job and see who he is connected uh, to my connection. So normally when I see Caroline in it, I will just write to Karen and say, hey, I've seen this job here. And then I can say, yeah, send me your CV, I'll send it. And I've been doing that over and over oh, until I found this EKFB. And uh, that's where I am today. So um, so always keep an eye on for that as a thing. So as I said, uh, um, my transition part was, uh, as I said, there wasn't that much at that time. So I spent six months doing um, um resettlement so basically just cv writing and nothing much job search and presently uh build force um just wanting to mention i left uh, uh, the uh, the navy uh, since 2011 
but I still use Bill Force. So as I said, I always have them in tow. So whenever I, uh, I'm down, I always turn to them and they always help me. They never said, oh, you have left ages ago. No, they always help me. They always, the door is always open. So um, uh, for me, that's, that's key uh, because they always wanted to help. Whether you left today or you left 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they always want to help. And I, I think that's very important And uh, for people like me because I left since 2011. So, so it, it, Talking about my job, uh, one of the key aspects of my job as uh, Julie Willnoy is based at Bista, that's where the head office for Oscar is. Um, my key relationship, these are the people that I work with, uh, logistics and security team, we call them Oscar, uh, delivery team, fleet uh, subcontractors, and uploads. Uh, these are abnormal loads. Uh, so they could be, um, um, these are loads like, um, you will need a sort of like an escort for them. Roads needs to be closed and things like that because they are not your usual types of load. So for instance, where I work now, um, it's a, kind of like a small village area. The roads are not that big. So if I have any uploads come in that require roads to be closed, we'll uh, contact, uh, this will be uh, related to the council uh, and order uh, like highway team and all the uh, stakeholders involved. So I deal with a lot actually. So if I have uh, uploads coming in um, that would require roads to be closed and things like that, I will have to talk to all the stakeholders involved, both internally and externally. Internally, project managers, uh, foremen, uh, site security, TM, traffic management, and externally, uh, uh, the council, um, uh, highway management people, uh, sometimes the police, because you know you needed them. Because um, not everyone is in favor of this contra, uh, this uh, um, project. So you have people demonstrating and things like that. So that's why sometimes it's, uh, uh, will be required to bring in the police as well to help with the movement of these uh, materials. Um, so yeah, I also work with traffic management team, uh, community engagement, because if road is to be closed, they need to be aware of in advance so um, they can take uh, or prepare better for it. So as I said, project managers, uh, foremen and work managers as well. So yeah, so my responsibility differs. I don't have a specific office. Uh, I tend to use where I am to, uh, the, today, is, uh, it's called Nasli Road. That's where I, I, I normally work, but I could be anywhere. I could be in London, Melton Keys, could be at Bista, could be at, um, uh, uh, yeah, yesterday I went to uh, Dunstable, so pretty much I could be anywhere. So these are some of my uh, key duties that I do. I'm responsible for planning and execution of all abnormal loads movement in the area. So my area, uh, as I said, um, NCA, um, EKFB is 80 kilometers long. So my area is only 10 kilometers in that. So I will be responsible for this sort of things that if this happen in my area. So a proactive, so engagement with all stakeholders, including external ones as well. Regular meetings, meetings does happen every day, all the times. So this job is hands-on. So you must be, uh, you know, because it's either all the stakeholders need you, your expertise in their, um, what they are doing, or you need them to what you are doing. So it's both ways. So you need to have a good relationship with uh, people that you work with as well, because that's key to this. The main key to this is teamwork. You must work together. That's the only thing um, that helps. If not, you will fail. Um, yeah, so that's the upload side of it. So my job is uh, in two. We have, I have abnormal load and fleet. So fleet means looking after the vehicle. Every vehicle in uh, NCA area, I'll look after them. So uh, so this is one of the things that I'll do, like uh, from uh, pro procurement, buying these vehicles, um, vehicle maintenance, if there's a breakdown, I will get a notification through an app to say that oh the vehicle has breakdown and uh, uh, whatever the breakdown was will be mentioned in that then I will uh, relay this to uh, either enterprise or AA directly and uh, they will come and uh, uh, fi fix it. <clears throat> There's also a fleet team um, which is route wide. Route wide will be the whole of e EKFB, so they look after the whole of EKFB. So I liaise with these people as well and uh, work hand in hand with them just like this morning they send the email out oh um uh well i got a call from them first to say that oh 
since everybody's going on Christmas, what do we do with the vehicles? Because if we leave them in this weather, the batteries will be flat. So need to come up with a solution. So the thing that we discussed was like, could we have A8 to come and jumpstart all our vehicles uh, at once, you know, so that they are ready when we get back and that we can just carry on as normal. But um, so that's something that we'll discuss with the uh, uh, fleet team later on as well. So this is what uh, uh, we are doing. So you see NCA here, this is not Chilton's area. So this is our area, this is our 10 kilometers. This is the main line. So in this main line, this is the work that we are doing. So we'll work in two major road uh, realignments just to allow uh, our uh, for us to build the uh, tracks and also touching minor roads and pro realignments. So this is something we'll be doing. So art works as well. So you know excavation and filling uh, lands as well. So the structures on your left hand side. Now this is key um, uh, to what we are doing because we need to make so many changes. So we will have. Uh, two uh, launch viaducts just for this 10 kilometers and eight over bridges as well and two under bridges uh, that we will be building in our section at NCA. So as you go along route white, you will um, uh, like A. So we are here now. So if you go across the road there, you will have A, which is Islesbury area. So they, they are taking over from us. Then from there, as you go in, I will show you something in the map. So this is the map where we are. So we are here, uh, North Chilton's area, which is like uh, Amsam or Wendover area. So across, next to us will be uh, AA, um, Ellsbury area. So this is all part of EKFB. Then you have Calvert, uh, uh, Typhoid, and then you will, you got Southam, which is all the way uh, around uh, Warwick here. So this is uh, this also will tell you where, um, sorry, uh, where all the HS2 uh, teams are. So this is Houston here in London. Uh, Olok is somewhere here. So they, they are in uh, 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 London. Uh, so this is in Houston. This is Olok, come on. So I happen to live around here actually. So it's, it's from my house, it's only one minute walk. So uh, they are there. So between us and them, there's another company called Align that's also building, doing the same thing. So, uh, so they hand it over to them then we take it over from Ireland. So we only see a fence. If you go down to one of our compound in uh, Plaza, which is at Great Messenden, we only see a fence. So they are there because we are taking over from them. So, and if you come all the way here, AA is taking over from us, then the, a culvert take over from AA and you go all the way, like that all the way up north. So, uh, that's how uh, HS2 is. So if you look at this here, so this will give an idea uh, how we operate. Um, just give me one second. Uh, sorry. So yeah, so this is where I am at the moment. This is uh, uh, Ambasia, uh, Nasli Overbridge. Um, Going up, you have Nasli uh, Culvert. So Wendover Dean Viaduct is somewhere around here. So this is all part of our area, our 10 kilometer area. So these are all compounds as well. So small Dean Viaduct will be up there. Um, Cottage Farm uh, um, is just somewhere around Rocky Lane. So this gives you a brief, uh, a brief idea how we are. So if you look down here, you'll uh, you'll see AA. So that's Islesbury area. So we take over. Uh, from uh, them uh, there. So uh, really my key uh, tips to, to anyone coming out of the military is uh, you as a person, just be, you know, be yourself. Uh, your key skills does matter. Communication and leadership, which we all have already, which can be implemented into these things. As, uh, that was the, my case at uh, um, Crossrail. As I said, when I joined Crossrail, I joined as an uh, operative and within three months, um, because of my dedication that I put to the work, I was promoted to logistics manager straight away because I already have these things in me. So I just implement them and you know, they, they accepted it and they sent me to do my courses and things like that. And the other thing is, as I say, is uh, networking is key. You must network. Um, as I said, I, I do something called LinkedIn cheat. I cheat LinkedIn. So what I'll do is like I log into LinkedIn and I um, 
uh, look at the passing ad, uh, advertising the job and uh, look at see who they are connected to on LinkedIn. And you know, if there's one of my connects, I just write to that person. I said, mostly Caroline. I'll say, hey, I've seen this job with this guy. Can you um, please, you know, put your weight behind for for it? And uh, you know, that's how I, you know, go on about it. And other thing is, do not restrict yourself. Um, when I joined UK Health Security Agency uh, as a planner, as a strategic planner, one of the key things we were looking for is scheduling, uh, like uh, planning. Uh, you know, I don't know if you go to town centers during COVID, you will find like testing centers where you can go and test uh, 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 for COVID and things like that. So those are things that I will arrange in the, in the background together with three other guys for the whole of uh, uh, England. So, uh, yeah, so but at that time, there are so many things that they were advertising um, the, uh, the job requirement uh, um, entails, but I do not have all of that like uh, to have access to that, uh, to know the software that they were using, which is like Airtable, it's like a scheduling, um, uh, it's like an Excel, but it's an advanced Excel. And it's also, uh, it's a cloud-based because you can access it anywhere. So not just uh, an Excel, but I do not have any knowledge of that, but I have experience in Excel. So I was able to uh, transfer those skills and, and uh, that's what makes it easier for me. I mean, look for help, pe uh, people in that area. I, you know, as uh, Julie mentioned, you know, uh, always ask, you know, ex-military community, always ask for help. It does help as well, because I, I left the military, as I said, 11, uh, since 2011. So I've been through all of this, you know, asking people for help, connections, you know, wherever, because I always, want to be doing something i just don't want to be sitting at one place and um, you know so always keep asking always keep asking it, it does help so yeah uh, um so um th those are my key tips as, as well and uh, one thing julie mentioned i want to elaborate more is uh, your first job out of the military shouldn't just it should be your stepping stone actually because you know once you are out there you will see all the interests uh, or the opportunities and you know you are allowed to move to progress further. Don't just sit at one place. Because as I said, when I left the military, uh, I was doing concierge job. Okay, but uh, I didn't want to do that. But I was doing it because I wanted to study daytime. So it does help that time. But once I graduated, I didn't want to do it anymore. Then that's when I started looking further uh, to do. And also, if you look at logistics as well, logistics has different functions. Uh, because I was working in an office, then I, um, I went to rail, I uh, went to constr uh, building construction, uh, you know, so I went to scheduling for UK Health Security Agency. Doesn't necessarily mean that if you're doing logistics, it's just one thing. Uh, if I'm doing logistics and construction today, if I leave this place uh, three years time, four years time, or when the contract finished, I will be able to transfer the skills into another things, like into project support or project uh, management jobs somewhere else where I believe that I can tr easily transfer these skills. So do not restrict yourself. Just look at it uh, just because you're doing logistics here. Probably you'll be doing the same thing there. It's just that they call it differently. But when you do your interviews, you know, your star modes and things like that, you can bring this out and uh, probably they will understand better what you are saying. And I think that's it from me. Well, listen, everybody, if you do have questions, just raise your hand or type them in the box and we'll we'll fire through them all. I'll kick off with a few. Julie, I'll start with you because you spoke first. Thank you very much for that insight. That was really, really good. I think a couple of observations I had was you've got that varied logistics career upon leaving the military. Do you think you're chipped subconsciously on this to change roles and employers every few years or were they with the more considered career moves? Um, <clears throat> no, it's good. that's a good question. I think I am chipped. I think, yeah, I think I am chipped with it. So my first job was, I got to about the sort of 18 month period and then thought, right, what's next? What's next? It, almost in that right, where's my next posting thinking? And, and maybe that's now where I like that project world of, there's a start, there's a middle of the end. It's yeah. generally around two or three years and then you're on to the next job. So yeah. I think, <clears throat> yeah, part of that is it maybe it's ingrained in me that every so often you move on to the next job and start the next one. 
which, which might not suit everyone but i think if that's if that does suit you then a project world is a way to go so in construction it's all very much projects so there'll be one big project and then you'll move on to something else and it's totally different and for example hs2 where usman is now um that's almost a series of projects in itself so there might you might be working on the civils bit for two years and then the rail bit comes along later so so yeah if, if people do want to stick with that kind of military move every two years then construction rail that environment is, is perfect for it absolutely perfect it does offer it so can you give us an insight in terms of what you, what does an average day or week look like for you so what time do you start um, in the morning um fairly early it yes so yeah average day i'll be in the office maybe half seven um go through sort of a few emails from the night before make coffee kind of review what my plan is for the day um and, and generally i will have a plan for the day but there'll be spanners thrown in by about sort of eight o'clock half eight in the morning so there's a little bit of firefighting in terms of i don't know the, the guys on site might not have got their material and and can't get it and therefore work has stopped and what do we do about that and and then you go through that whole process of did they order it? Where's it come from? How are we going to get it? And sort of a little bit of firefighting like that. Um, and then they'll, I've generally got three or four meetings in the day that might be either an interview for recruitment because I'm sort of constantly recruiting people to fill roles in different depots. Um, or it might be a meeting about how we forecast what material that we need to build the job for the next six months and how do we work that out and how do we know what we're going to build and where do we get that information from and what are we ordering so that we're not ordering too much. Um, and then we might have another meeting maybe on um, maybe on sort of health and safety, best practice, compliance, training, what we're doing about using machines in yards and how we keep that safe and how we teach people what they should be doing. Um, and then there's, there's a few other different work elements that I'm involved in, more of a project management point of view on, on this job, not specifically logistics. Um, but from a logistics world, it's it's a good mix of kind of planning for what is about to happen and the operational little bit of chaos of the plan went wrong and we, we're going to have to fix it so and maybe that's not for everyone but if, if you like that sort of operational bit of everything then then it's, it's perfect really I don't don't ever get bored and I generally will go home late because I th you you naturally get dragged into things which aren't logistics just because because you're there so can you sort this can you do that so it's yeah it's, it's logistics doesn't isn't just a one box that certain things fit in you you get dragged into all sorts which is and good. Are, you in a, are you in a five day week do you work weekends yes yeah generally uh don't work weekends in the rail job that i worked i worked occasional nights occasional weekends but generally my job is Monday to Friday, sort of half seven till, I don't know, six. Okay, um, and you spoke about two distinct skill sets there, the the planning, the foresight, thinking strategically. Is that how your mind works? Is that what your USP is? Or are you more over here on the operational firefighting, thinking on your feet, responding? You're a blend I, of both. I, th I think, yeah, I think I'm a mix of both. And, mm -hmm. And it's very much that if you if you get the planning right, you have to do less of the firefighting. <laughs> but but sometimes the bits that create the chaos are outside of your control. So if I don't know work stops on site because I don't know there's no design available. So so all that work stops and we've just ordered a load of materials and we've got yeah. trucks there to move stuff around and it and it's all stopped. Then you you have to go back to that organisational stuff. I'm, I'm trying to get more more involved in the strategic planning bits but then the the operational chaos does add the bit of excitement that i think you do need a bit of that just to I keep think you on your toes needs a bit of that Julie. yeah exactly <laughs> all, just just wait till we all crave it but it's a quiet day so 
Um, and in terms of the most enjoyable part of the day, why is it you love being a logistics manager? Um, I think I think the amount of things that you get involved in or that I get involved in, it's not just move, getting some trucks to move things from A to B and it's not just setting up a yard to issue some stuff and it and it's not just how we're moving things around. There's a lot of elements that affect that and then you can I can always now pick and choose what I get involved in on on the periphery of that so for example if it's we haven't got the right competencies of people people aren't trained to the right standard well I can get involved in the training world and then develop a training package to look to kind of put onto that and see what it looks like so it's 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 almost a sort of it's not too well defined that I just deal with this I can get involved in in more I can get involved in the commercial side in the sort of contract side in subcontractors in people it all it all kind of feeds into that that big mix that big mix and you mentioned it didn't you that six months you spent in the procurement space for a company to be able to win a job it needs every single skill set to be able to pull that tender and that submission together so you you do I think even on an annual basis your, your role can look different from the, the year before and um, Adams asked a question around courses so what courses mm. have you attended what do you have under your belt um a good question and so since I left the army, I did, um, as part of my resettlement, I did project management courses. So I did APMP and PRINCE2. And I think they've given me a good grounding and a good understanding of managing projects. Mm -hmm. Have I, could I have got away without them? Probably yes. But but they, I think they just add tools to the box, really. Um since leaving the military i haven't done many courses at all i've done a couple of one day courses that were sort of kind of specific on um the systems we were using at the time so very much like the industry systems that we were using i've done a few courses like that i've done a um a management course mm -hmm. which which i think anyone coming out of the military has already got that training and, and competency anyway how to manage better basically and what what managers should do but i think any anyone that that's come out of the military whatever rank you've already done that kind of leadership and behavioral and management training so i wouldn't i wouldn't say that that's needed really but in terms of technical logistic courses i haven't done any i've done I, oh, wow. and maybe i should maybe i should have done that. i don't know but i've it, it's not something that I feel I don't need to do courses to be able to progress in that logistics world. But again, if if someone wants to do something specific, for example, a transport planner, then then maybe that like they would it's better to do that course. So where Usman's working in the kind of abnormal load industry, then you know, he, he might at some point want to go down that transport planning route, in which case there's courses available. So I've not I've not done any courses, but what I have uh, what I have done is become an associate member of SILT, um, right. Charter Institute of Logistics and Transport. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good thing to sign up to. Um, and you can sign up as a as a veteran. It's You, you pay a, an annual fee, I think. It, it's not ridiculous. It's 160 quid, something like that. But the, there's a lot of opportunity in there. There's a lot of um, online um, learning forums. There's There's different events that you can go to there's different speakers there's there's so much information about all different industries and how they work I think if you're if you're just starting your career that's good to get involved in just just to absorb that information and make your contacts and, and just for general understanding really so I think in hindsight what I should have done is signed up to that when I first left rather than 12 months ago Okay, no, that's brilliant advice. Thank you, Julie. Um, two quick questions before we get to Usman. Pay parity. Um, how long did it take before you were back on your military salary again? Um, I think maybe two years. Two, right. Between two and three years, I think. Okay. Um, 
yeah and, and I think it's just acceptance that you maybe start a bit lower but you're learning the ropes and um and at some point you'll you'll start creeping up again I think I think that was just a sort of acceptance thing okay um, and in your role now you are earning more than you were in the military is that right yes yeah, yeah okay good yeah. right and a question from Jay. So um, we get this working from home question a lot. So obviously having worked away for 24 years, um, he's now looking for a work-life balance. Um, he wants to be there to get the milk in the morning. So Jay, I'm going to put you in touch with my husband who didn't do that this morning. So I've still not had a coffee. Um, but in terms of working from home, is that viable? Is that an option as a logistics manager? Um, I would say very difficult to work from home as a logistics manager okay. logistics is very much about the operational piece the support piece and you you have to interact with the with the team that you're supporting so you you will be delivering logistics for somebody now if they're all in the office and they're all planning the job and reacting to what's happening on site you sort of need to be in that mix really mm -hmm. um but but again going back to the logistics is done differently in different disciplines that's the sort of operational yeah. construction type logistics if you work more in a strategy role that is looking at future planning and logistics maybe that is more of a, a work from home job so i think it would depend what industry you're going into and what sort of logistics you're looking at if, if you're looking at long term and planning then then yes if you're looking at logistics manager on a on a project then i would say it's quite difficult really well okay. uh, saying that there's a lot of companies now that do a sort of friday working from home they do maybe monday to thursday in the office and then most people work on a friday at home okay and again what you are trying to do Jay, is just get a project close to home so that you are able to go home of an evening as well that would just yes, help the work-life yeah. balance but we can help you with that so thank you for that julie that was fantastic a few more questions to ask but we'll go to usman so Usman, thank you for that presentation. You spoke brilliantly about your role on HS2. Why do you enjoy it so much? What's the best bits? Uh, the challenge. It's really challenging, actually, because um, you, you deal with quite a lot. Because um, 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 like my day is not like yesterday, what I did be completely different from the other day. And what takes my time is the meetings because uh, I have to respond for meetings a lot because um, this is more hands-on. As Julie said, uh, um, it must be more hands-on. So you're dealing with your stakeholders, with the holiest. Mm -hmm. So with HS2, you realize that there is more external stakeholders involved in this job than internally, you know. So the uh, reason why I said Crossrail was more internal. We don't have any environment, so the council don't bother us that much. But H2 is completely different. So, uh, um, yeah, so my time is all like meetings, meetings, meetings. So um, that's why I have to be on site most of the time. Sometimes I try to work from home. So I don't have a start time or uh, end time. So I could get here at 7 or 6.30 or whatever. I just carry on what I need. Um, yeah. So I'll be like, oh, I'm going to go home at 4. I'm going to go home at 3. Or something else come on. I have to go to another compound. I have to go there. So I, I just walk, you know, as I supposed to be. So if there is a lead time, or I, I can look at my calendar and say, oh yeah, this is good. I just stay home. Then I walk from there. So like for us in our department, my boss doesn't bother us. Say as long as the work is done, you know what you are doing. Just do what you're doing, you know. So um. Just to come back to what the other guy was asking, you know, you don't want to stay away from home that lot. You, you can still get that here in HS2, uh, you know, because, you know, um, door to door is uh, 12 hours, maximum 14 hours. So obviously you have time to uh, go home and stay with your family. I, I've never worked in a weekend, but from next year, my working pattern will change because I'll be starting sometimes around 12 midnight or two o'clock in the morning. Or, and finish at four o'clock because when I start having uploads coming in, like the tunnel boring machines and stuff like that, I, it can only be done when people are sleeping. Right. Because I'll take mm. over the whole road. So mm. uh, yeah, so I'll be working from midnight uh, till uh, four or five o'clock in the morning. Okay. So and yeah. 
is it will, will your salary stay the same for that will you get a slight uplift for that oh it, it, yes yes I, I mean um um one thing you get from hs2 you get a lot of benefits um when i first started they said oh your, your job your role comes with a car company car mm -hmm. i said oh no i don't need it <laughs> but that time i don't know the area so Coming to work first day, I was late an hour fifty nine. Ah, uh, when the I got to nowhere, isn't yeah, it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, my boss was laughing at me. He was like, "What was the problem?" I said, "I rejected the car." I, I said, "Call them now." I called them. They said, "Oh, uh, it's gonna take three weeks." I said, "No, I need it now." So two days later, they sent me a car. So what I'm doing? So now they've ordered me a car, like uh, environmental friendly one. So that should come uh, end of January. So I will use that. So I also have a four by four that I use at work. So uh, when you join HS2, it, um, that's what most of the guys will do who don't have like company cars and things like. When you get to work, you use company cars because we are all over. So those are the benefits. And you know, you got your travel allowance, you got your pensions, uh, your healthcare. So it, it does come with uh, um lots of benefits and I, I was surprised actually so uh, because when i look at the journals like, uh, but when i started i realized that uh, it's more than uh, what uh, they are actually offering yeah. so yeah it was good and the role itself you described it sounds quite diverse what what courses have you had to attend um as part of the role or to upskill generally in the logistics space <laughs> yes um <laughs> You know, it's really funny because even when I started here, they, they never asked me for my CSCS card. Mm -hmm. You know, I was asking my boss about this. I said, oh, he said, they never asked me anything. The job don't comes with it. But because we are in construction, I just have my CSCS uh, card on me. But nobody did ask this from us. So I, I was surprised because that's why I asked my boss, who's also ex-military. I said, I, they never asked me this. He said, me either. Uh, you know, so but I have my triple STS, SMSTS, and all that, so which are about to expire next year. Okay. So what I did was I uploaded onto my parent company's uh, portal. So what it do is uh, does is like at the end uh, when it's going to expire, they will get a notice, mm -hmm. and they will book me on the courses. Yeah, but right. okay. yeah, so the SMSTS job. Yes, course you've got. Any other courses you have? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, card obviously. Yeah. Yes. So as Julie said, uh, this job, one of the criteria is uh, uh, Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. Good for you. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> the good thing is I haven't done it. I, um, I'm working on it. So I did mention to them that, look, I'm doing this at the moment. They said, oh, it's fine. We'll accept it as it is. So once I'm done, uh, I will just submit to them. So that's really important um, uh, as well. But, uh, you know, uh, uh yeah so uh, i don't think you need to add much courses but uh, there are certain things you're going to need them because it's one of the criteria for a job uh, well, to come and that's why i've asked the question because obviously the candidates now will be drafting their cv they're going to be applying for the roles so how can they make their cv look as attractive and as strong as possible and our, our, well, some certain courses help along the way, and that's to both you and Julie, if you've got any advice for the, the CVs themselves as they're applying for either assistant logistics roles or, or logis logistician roles themselves. Any tips or hit, tips or hints? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, for me, you know, I, I had this chat with you in the beginning of the year when I applied for BB, uh, BBV and not, um, yeah. HS2 at uh, Birmingham. So, well, I did learn a lot from Bill Force guys uh, anyway. So if you see a job description, all you need to do is look at that description and tailor your CV accordingly. They don't want to know anything else uh, outside of that job description. So if they are looking for, uh, let's say, a stores assistants or logistician or something that nature or logistics manager, trust me, whatever they put there, that's all they are looking for. They don't need anything else outside because remember the guys going through these uh, CVs don't have that much time to be like looking for exactly what he wanted and what he advertised for. So just, you know, tailor your CV as it is, you know, qualifications, put them down there, what you have done and put them down there uh, and you will get a hit on it. Um, yeah, but uh, that's my advice.
Great advice. Osman. And um, Julie, do you have any advice in the, the CV space? Yes, that, and and Usman, that's really good advice. I think that yeah, that's spot on. Um, and what I'd add to that as well is because I'm in I'm in a really lucky position now that I've been able to recruit people into into a few different roles from my last few jobs. Um, so I keep I keep coming back to Caroline and have have you got somebody and have you got somebody for this and have you got someone else for this and and that's a great place to be in. And I see some really good CVs that come in. Um, and I and I think exactly that if you can match it to the role, it reads a little bit better. But but also some of the CVs, I think they're almost overcomplicated. Just keep them simple. Try not to try not to match your military job role to a civilian job role because you might not know what that it is. So you you know I might I might see a warrant officers match themselves to a senior project manager. Well, that's doesn't really match across very well. So I think just just put down exactly what you have done in the army, but put the facts and figures with it as well. So if you if you were a storeman, put down what size of stores you managed, how many line items. We have 500 line items. We have uh, we're managing 15 wagons that come in every week. We issue, I don't know, 100 issues every day. Put it into that level of kind of detail of numbers and then whoever's reading it just knows automatically they can then picture that so so sort of try and take out the 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 floweriness and just facts and figures and really simple reads really well i think okay now that's that's really good advice and when you get to interview skills because i think what a lot of our Armed Forces candidates feel, and we too agree, is we just need their foot in the door because the minute they are kind of staring eye to eye with an employer, they can do the rest. Um, but obviously that, that CV is an important part. And when it comes to the interview, in terms of just quickly advising in, in, in that space, should they be giving examples, tangible examples of what they've managed logistically? Should they be focusing on, on wider skill sets around um, strategy and planning and, and management and leadership? Or do you, is it just going back to, to what has been said, just focus on the role? Uh, I mean, in terms of interview, first thing, know your CV. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> it happens to me once. And the uh, first question they asked was, uh, walk us through your CV. <sighs> I was like, oh, my God, you did the worst thing. Yeah, so know your CV. Uh, probably the, it, the, Because you have to remember, this, most people, most of these people interviewing are not HR. They don't have interviewing skills at all. They just want to get down to the job. So they don't really care about certain things. I mean, I've done interviews where they only ask two certain things. Have you done Excel? Have you done planning? That was it. So just be very careful. If you apply a job, you read your uh, job description very, very well. Uh, because that's all they're going to ask for. They would not ask you anything else beyond um so that's why they advertise for the role so really read the job description i'm telling you this from from experience because i've been through everything you know my cv was like four pages i sent it to bill first they are like no it's too much you reduce it so these are all the things <laughs> so yeah so i've been through a lot and because you know you are tempted you want to put all those things that you've been through there but in reality nobody cares all they want to know is like we're advertising for this job are you a perfect fit Anything outside that, it's just not their problem. So, yeah, so as I said, um, uh, know the job description very well uh, and uh, take it from there. Uh, don't panic. Take your time. You don't understand something. Um, ask again. Tell them to rephrase it. Uh, that's it. And the one thing we do say to the candidates on the CV is if you are at the start of your transition and you don't know which path, to pursue, you're maybe hovering between site management, maybe even a logisticians, a plan B or C, a project management update as well. You do need to start with that genetic CV, but it's a process, it's a journey you're on as you start 
progressing down each pathway as we start connecting you to mentors you attend these virtual chats you start to better understand each of the careers and that's when if you want to make nuances and have a, a, a specific discipline led cv you're able you're definitely able to do it well, listen, thank you to both Julie and Osman for their incredible contribution today. The transition from the armed forces to that career in logist logistics will keep you on your feet. And it's the challenge that many of you desire. We've heard from excellent employers today from Kier and from AKFB. So a shout out to them for continuing to be excellent ambassadors within the armed forces community. And you are not alone. Build Force are here to support and guide you as you transition. So please get in touch if you have any questions and we can help you take this further. A quick reminder, we are here next Thursday, the 8th of December at 10 o'clock with David Duncan from Vistry and Richard Whitehouse from SB3. So that's the JV between Becky Solange and Balfour BT Ground Engineering, another JV on HS2. And we will be discussing health and safety as a discipline next week. But listen, thank you to everybody dialing in. Just get your queries over to us. If this is something you're interested in or you would like to speak to Julie and Usman further, we can certainly connect you. But thank you, everyone, for dialing in. And I'm going to get in the car and go to Starbucks. I think I've deserved it this morning. So have a good day, everyone. And take care. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.